even if there was a sectarian Jewish teacher living in Palestine during the first half of the first century called Joshua Jesus. He had nothing at all to do with the crucified Christos of Paul's theology. Thus had no part to play in the formation of that distinctive amalgam of faiths that eventually swept the world. I believe that the innocent collection of tales and sayings which was apparently allowed to pass freely among the beleaguered selves of believers in hourly danger of discovery and execution was but a cover story. We are dealing with myth, not history. Whether there ever was a Jewish messianic pretender named Joshua or Jesus, who was crucified at the instigation of his fellow countrymen in the procuratorship of Pontius Pilate, we shall probably never know. It hardly matters. The inner councils of the church were aware of secret writings which were not to be promulgated even among the faithful. As the second century church father Clement of Alexandria said, not everything that is true needs necessarily to be divulged to all men. It's no secret that Christmas parties and New Year's parties promote inebriation with the celebration, or at very least, a toast. Inebriation is part of the most traditional celebrations, and it may not surprise you to learn that the combination of inebriation and celebration dates back to our tribal ancestors. What may surprise you, however, is the fact that modern-day religion also has direct ties to ritualistic inebriation. These rituals and celebrations throughout antiquity were often annual events, and these annual events were marked by particular celestial alignments. Plants and humans have shared this planet together for millions of years. Plants have been our never-ending source of food and clothing and shelter and each day as we see the sunrise we know that the sun sustains our life and it sustains the lives of our plant allies however this magnificent story of the yearly cycle of the sun and the cycles of the moon and the stars and the plants have become hidden these stories have been suppressed for so long that they've become mythology. And there is another extremely important human-plant relationship that has been overlooked for so long that it's become taboo. We've laid claim to the term inebriology, which up until now has been this fictitious field of study and a term used by drunken college students, but we couldn't think of a better word to describe a study pertaining to the symbolism and the history of ritualistic and celebratory inebriation.
This involves an in-depth study of shamanism and the sacred plants themselves. Plants, mushrooms, and various plant combinations have traditionally been used by the shaman, or the medicine man, for many millennia for healing, for extremely deep levels of meditation, and in their ceremonies, in their rituals, and rites of passage as well. All of it hidden in language, artwork, myth, and tradition. And a focus on this artwork, myth, and tradition will guide us on our journey through the ancient mysteries, combining the understanding of plant knowledge with celestial knowledge. The older medieval cathedrals were often called mystery schools, and the mystery schools were primarily used for religious, mystical, and even scientific study. However, there were no congregations. They were not open to the public. Mystery schools were structured similar to the way Freemasons structure their teachings. One enters as an initiate, much like a fraternity, and was often sworn to secrecy. In fact, we still have fraternities and sororities that stem from these ancient mystery schools. Modern education's 12 grades and mortar boards stem from this ancient knowledge. In my recent books, in particular The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, The Dead Sea Scrolls and the Christian Myth, and the forthcoming Physician Heal Thyself, I've tried to demonstrate something of the multi-layered structure of the Gospel narratives and teachings. Their decipherment is difficult, and was intended to be so. Just as the Essene secrets were not for the eyes of the uninitiated, even their written works were wrapped up and hidden in caves, or in the final emergency simply wrenched apart and thrown into a secret underground chamber. Their most vital mysteries were never committed to writing, as Josephus makes clear, but passed only by word of mouth under awful oaths of silence. These mystery schools would instruct their members by way of elaborate dramas, using a play or a metaphor as a method of initiation and education. So let's begin with one of the oldest teachings to ever emerge from the mystery schools, on earth as it is in heaven. And another way of making the statement is to say, as above, so below. It's an acknowledgement of the polar opposites, light and dark, good and evil. This is yin and yang, the macrocosm and the microcosm. In philosophy, alchemy, and many other ancient teachings speak of this macrocosm and microcosm. That which is above is also below. And this relationship of polar opposites is one of the most essential and the most overlooked elements in understanding ancient philosophy and religion. The greater and the lesser. The positive and the negative. Heaven and hell. The macrocosm and the microcosm. These polar opposites are in perfect balance with one another. And you can think of the macrocosm-microcosm relationship like octaves on a piano. They may vibrate at different frequencies, but they still work in harmony together. This is a representation of the Yggdrasil tree, which portrays the concept, that which is above is also below. The tree has branches and leaves above ground, and it has branching roots burrowing underground, the Chthonic realm. As in the heavens, so on earth. This dualistic philosophy has been applied all throughout antiquity in religion, alchemy, and mysticism. The constellations in the sky make up the greatest story ever told, and among these constellations are the anthropomorphized gods of mythology, Gemini, Hercules, Andromeda, Cepheus, and the rest. Also in the sky are the animals, such as Aquila, Hydra, Taurus, Pisces, and so on. These aren't exactly anthropomorphisms, but rather zoomorphisms, and were also revered as gods. In fact, this is where we get the word zodiac from, as zo comes from the word zoo, zodiac. 
Well, the Bible tells us that although we are mortals, we are gods as well. Consequently, this application of the zodiac signs to our bodies occurs in symbolism. On earth as it is in heaven, the temple of God is in the heavens and it dwells within us as well. Nevertheless, we create these anthropomorphisms, these gods built out of combinations of nature, celestial gods, plant gods, fertility gods, or compound gods containing many different elements. And they were all worshipped and written about as though they were living deities. Even if there was a sectarian Jewish teacher living in Palestine during the first part of the first century called Joshua or Jesus, he had nothing at all to do with the crucified Christos of Paul's theology, and thus had no part to play in the formation of that distinctive amalgam of faiths that eventually swept the world. As far as the Gospel narratives of Jesus are concerned, we can free ourselves forever from the need to lay bare a reality on which to base a more historically convincing portrait of a first century teacher who in three short years was supposed to have founded a new religion or so transformed an existing messianic faith that it could become almost immediately acceptable to a Gentile world. We are dealing with myth, not history. The question we now have to ask is, what was the nature and purpose of that myth? Sol Invictus is often referred to as Mithra because of their strong correlation. In fact, the Persian and Roman sun god Mithra in the Mithraic Kronos, or personification of infinite time, is in the center of the zodiac. He is surrounded by his twelve helpers, or the twelve helpers of the sun. You will often find a goddess, a sun, or some sort of divine entity inside the zodiac when depicted in art. There are even old paintings and murals of Christ sitting on a throne surrounded by his twelve helpers. Sometimes these are depicted as twelve angels, and other times the twelve disciples. We've even found some that are depicted as the twelve signs of the zodiac. The important thing to know about the deity is that the deity is merely a character. It is the character's characteristics and the physical posture that are important. The name of the character can be interchanged and applied to different cultures and ages, but the numerous characteristics have remained the same in various deities, including Christ, Krishna, Horus, Mithra, Buddha, Quetzalcoatl, and many others. Many of these characteristics represent this star of wonder, this only begotten son of the creator, god of god, light of light, very god of very god, begotten, not made. In other words, and as Jordan Maxwell likes to point out, this ball of light in the sky is not our responsibility, it's God's responsibility. It's not our sun, it's God's sun. This worshipful sun is the main star of all stars. It's the only star that is of real importance to us because it gives us our life. And likewise in this macrocosmic personification, the sun and all other stars in the sky are kings, making Jesus and Horus and all the other sun gods the king of kings. Mythology never ended. Jesus is the newest myth, and most people are smart enough to know this fact, but so many are just too frightened to face it. The animals in my house tend to follow the warm sunlight around the house in the morning time. And these splashes of sun on the floor are in different locations at 7 a.m. in the spring versus 7 a.m. in the fall. It's the tilting of the Earth's axis that brings about these seasonal changes. And as simple of a concept as this may be, this is the gateway into some of religion's most guarded mysteries. If you film, videotape, or even take a time-lapse photograph of the northeastern section of the night sky on a clear night, 
you will see the apparent rotation of the stars around the North Star as the Earth rotates on its axis. But notice as these stars appear to spin in a circle, the stars on the eastern horizon appear to rise just like the Sun does. Before there were calendars and long before there were street lights on every corner, one could watch the night sky and know when to prepare for winter or when to plant the crops. However, today with our bright lights in big cities, it's growing more and more difficult to see the stars at night due to something called light pollution. Our ancestors didn't have this problem. Their mystery schools and celebrations and their rituals were centered upon these yearly and easily observed celestial cycles and the night sky would come to life with its stars. In order to better understand these yearly celestial cycles, let's begin in spring. At 8.30 a.m. we see that the sun is above the horizon and behind it is the constellation Pisces. And as we fast forward to autumn, we notice that the sun appears to remain in the same region of the sky at this particular time of day. And if we fast forward two months, we see that the sun appears to be in a completely new location at this exact same time of morning. When we superimpose the position of the sun at 8.30 a.m. in the early autumn with the position of the sun on Christmas morning at this very same time of day, the movement is obvious. This falling occurs under the sign of Scorpio in the autumn. The scorpion is the backbiter. It can betray you by looking you in the eye while it stings you with its tail. And when stung, the bite of a scorpion can resemble two lips like a kiss. This is symbolized in scripture with the story of Judas, and Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss, and from this point forward, Jesus is symbolically falling to his death. And in nature, from this point forward, from our earthly perspective, the sun appears to be rising on the horizon closer and closer to the south each day. It's been falling to its death since its brush with a scorpion. And every day, it's been moving further and further to the south, and the days are getting shorter and shorter, the nights are getting longer and longer, and it's getting colder and colder. On the first day of the winter solstice, December 21st, the sun will not only cease its apparent descent into this abyss, but it also stops this southerly movement. And for three days, the sun will appear to rise on the horizon in the exact same place. No longer does it appear to fall, because fall has ended. After the sun has appeared to be dead for three days, having not moved in its usual fashion, it begins to move in the opposite direction, to the north, and the cycle continues. And depending on the Earth's yearly angle with the Sun, if you lived above the 66.5 to the 67 degree latitude line, you would notice that during these three days of the Sun's symbolic death, there is no Sun in the sky. In this part of the world, which just so happens to be the part of the world where our Norse traditions of the Christmas holiday come from, the Sun will remain below the horizon, in the Chthonic realm, sometimes called Hell for three days. These are all allegories of our day star. Ironically, the term day star has been adopted by many Christian churches around the world. Jesus is the day star, the king of kings. Another star that challenged this day star for the light of the morning was called the morning star, known to us today as the planet Venus. Because this morning star challenged the light of our Sun, the day star, or Jesus, it was known as Lucifer. What is the significance of being born under a star? 
Horus was born under a star to the virgin Isis. Jesus was also said to have been born under a star to a virgin mother. This is all part of a microcosmic personification of an event occurring in the sky in the morning hours of December 25th. It's a clever way to represent that which is above and that which is below by depicting the actual star and the personified deity. The ancients created entire cultures and mythologies around these ideas known as astral theology. And because the heavens reflect the will of the great architect, man has been in constant attempt to reproduce on earth what is seen in the heavens. In the typical Christian version of this story, three wise men follow this star to the birth of the newborn Savior. And what is this star, and who are these wise men or three kings following it? And does this star somehow lead these three kings to the birth of a sun god? The answers to these questions are literally written in the stars. During the Christmas season, you can go outside at night and look to the east, and there on the horizon you will see the real three kings of the east. And they'll be following the brightest star in the sky. And these stars mark the location where the sun will rise on Christmas Day. This was even more obvious 2,000 years ago when these legends began, but they can still easily be seen today. These stars will not be in this location at other times of the year. They sweep down to form this alignment during the solstice, or during the Christmas season. It's rather precise, actually, and you can see it with your own eyes. If you go outside during the evening in mid-December, look to the eastern horizon, and wait until you see Orion's belt rise on the horizon, you'll notice that it's been dark for quite some time while you wait for this to happen. But if we wait one month and go outside during the evening in mid-January, the sky will look completely different. Now, when you look to the eastern horizon and wait until you see Orion's belt rising on the horizon, you will notice that it's too light outside to see any stars, and Orion's belt cannot be seen on the horizon. But if we go back to December 24th, Christmas Eve, and you go outside and you wait until you see Orion's belt appear on the eastern horizon, you will notice that these three stars appear to begin their journey across the sky immediately at dusk. This constellation rises on the horizon just when the sky is dark enough to expose the stars. And these stars travel further across the night sky on Christmas Eve than they do any other night. On this midnight, also on the eastern horizon, you will see Virgo, the Virgin, peeking her head above the horizon. By 3.30 a.m. on Christmas morning, the Virgin is completely above the horizon. She then takes her position. She prepares to symbolically give birth to the sun after stepping on the head of serpents, the celestial serpent, with her foot. The morning sun will rise just below Virgo on this particular morning as though she were giving birth to it, the mythological birth of the sun god born of a virgin. After the sunrise on Christmas morning, the bird, Aquila, will appear to be standing on the sun. If we swing around to the west at this very moment, we will see the serpent Hydra winding its way around the horizon. This brings us back to the symbol of the Yggdrasil tree with the bird above and the serpent below. This symbol will be predominant throughout this video. The tree is now branching out into the heavens above the earth. Symbolically, the Yggdrasil tree is growing to represent the world tree. The further we zoom out from this philosophy, 
The Yggdrasil tree becomes the Axis Mundi, otherwise known as the Axis of the Earth, branching out into the stars and churning the milky heavens. This is symbolic of the polar opposites of the Earth. Because the Earth is tilted on an axis, the stars appear to rotate around the North Star at night. Not only does the Earth spin upon this axis, but due to the gravitational pull of the Sun, Moon, and other planets, it also wobbles like a top on this axis. One complete wobble has been called a great year, a stellar year, a planetary year, and the precession of the equinoxes. One complete great year takes roughly 25,800 years. This 25,800 year period is divided into the 12 houses of the zodiac, making the 12 ages. Just as a normal year is divided into the 12 houses of the zodiac to make 12 months. As a result, we enter a new great month, or new age, every 2,150 years. Just as a normal year has 12 months, the great year has 12 ages, and they are marked with the exact same signs that we are all familiar with. But unlike the commonly understood procession of the equinoxes, which runs forward through the zodiac in the normal monthly progression or procession, during the precession of the equinoxes, we go backward through the zodiac as we enter new ages. By working our way backwards through the zodiac, we may begin to understand how the signs of the zodiac have affected symbolism throughout history. Everybody knows that Christianity is a kind of Judaism, a very extreme, almost ridiculous form of Judaism, with the Messiah given a quite non-Jewish slant and so on and so forth. Now, to an historian, religious historian, the most important thing is to know where these ideas came from and how they were fused. All of the zodiac signs are governed by the four elements. Earth and water are elements that are considered to be feminine in nature. We've all heard of the earth being called mother. Another name for the seas is marine, taken from Latin mare or mary, meaning sea. So this feminine, water-bound sign marking the age of cancer can be seen as a representation of the matrilineal structures of that age. Call it a coincidence, but for some 6,000 to 7,000 years ago, we were mostly matrilineal and egalitarian in our social structuring. It was an egalitarian society, where men committed to the society as a whole because of the matrilineal structuring. The end of the age of Gemini, with the twins, also happens to mark the time period of the end of matrilineal, egalitarian social structuring, where males and females were equals, or twins so to speak. The bull then became a symbol of patriarchy about the time of the age of Taurus, symbolized by Lord Krishna with a bull. Bulls were also sacred in the patriarchal Egypt, and in ancient Persia and Rome, in many statues and paintings, you will see Mithra stabbing the bull, taking humankind out of the age of the bull, or rather, out of the age of Taurus. The stories of the Bible tell us that Moses came down from the mountain with the tablets of the new law on two separate occasions. The first time he came down the mountain with the law, he noticed that his people had fashioned a golden calf and were worshipping it. Moses gets angry with this and throws the tablets against the rocks, literally breaking the law. Sometimes you will find artwork of the Ten Commandments showing the bull in the background with the sun disk between his horns, similar to Apis of Egypt. When Moses and the Jews are blowing the shofar to the heavens in praise, they are using a ram's horn. They are worshipping their Lord by the use of the ram. Moses is often depicted with horns coming out of his head as a representation of Ares, the ram. This head of Moses resembles that of biblical tradition, and biblical tradition reflects the old mystery schools. The wrinkled face and heavy eyebrows, the forehead bearing horns in accordance with the tradition of the mystery play actors. In other words, the story of the sun and stars was kept alive in the mystery schools. One of the characters was Moses, and he represented the ram of Ares by showing him with ram's horns on his head. 
This filtered down into religious traditions by showing Moses with horns on his head or his followers blowing the ram's horn in worship. This is not some form of devil worship. It is symbolic of the age of Aries. The previous age was Taurus, the bull. This is the bull, or rather the age, which the Moses character was leading his people away from. This age of the ram ended with the slaughter of the ram when Father Abraham, the father of Christianity, slaughtered a ram instead of his son. Just as Mithra kills the bull to usher in the age of the ram, Abraham kills the ram of Ares to usher in the next age, the age of Pisces. Jesus takes us out of the age of Ares into the age of Pisces. And what was his first miracle? He turns regular water into wine and feeds the masses with two fish. These represent the two fish of Pisces. Jesus was the fisher of men. Christians today often put a fish symbol on the back of their car or on their clothes. The Pope's mitre is a fish head, looking exactly like the fish heads, representing the age of Pisces, the age of Christianity, the age of the fish. So even the clergy reflect this age. But the symbol, the symbol of the fish comes from the Vesca, the Vesca Piscis or the Vesca Pisces. And the Vesica is a symbol of the spiritual portal which emerges from the harmonious balance of two complementary polarities. Intuition and intellect, knowledge and practice, yin and yang, and heaven and the earth, spirit and science. It's two complementary polarities that create this, this spiritual portal. If you consider its shape, it is a spiritual portal. It is the shape of the yoni. We must have this spiritual portal in order to exist. The only way for us to enter into this dimension is through this portal, which emerges from the harmonious balance of two complementary polarities, male and female, as we enter into this dimension through this spiritual portal. Our Lady of Guadalupe is often seen standing inside this symbol of the Vesica. Pagan traditions will have people being drawn through this symbol, physically drawn through this symbol as they are said to have been born again, born into this cult or into this family. So just to bring a close to the talk of ages and becoming to the end of an age, in Matthew 28, 20, Jesus says that I am with you always, to the very end of the age. So when the age ends, well, I'm with you always, to the end of the age. So there is an age to come. Luke tells us that there is an age to come. in the age and in the world which are to come. So if, if Jesus is with us until the end of the age, and this age is about to end, is this reflected in the Bible? And it is. As Jesus is about to be crucified, the end of Jesus in the Bible, as Jesus is about to be crucified, he is going to have his last meal, or the last supper. And the day came of the unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go make preparations for us to eat the Passover. This is the last supper. And they replied saying, Where do you want us to prepare for it? Where are we going to prepare this last meal for you? And Jesus said to them, Behold, when you enter into the city, a man shall meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house that he entereth in. And symbolically, this is stating you will recognize the new age by a man bearing a pitcher of water. And you will follow him into the house. And houses are the houses of the zodiac. So this house is represented by a man bearing a pitcher of water. And that's exactly what the age of Aquarius is, is the 
man with the water pitcher. You don't see men in history bearing water. You see the woman fetching the water, the woman at the well, the women with the water pot on their head. So a man carrying the water pot is symbolic. It's symbolic of perhaps a return, a slow return to egalitarianism. Abraham was going to stab his son, but instead he ends up stabbing the ram. Just as Mithra was stabbing the bull and Jesus was stabbed on the cross. When Jesus was stabbed on the cross, his blood was collected in a cup. This cup has been a long sought after treasure for many people all throughout the ages. And we're going to talk about this cup. We're going to talk about the body and the blood now. And this is a good segue into communion where Christians will participate in a ritual, a, a blood drinking ritual, a mock blood drinking and flesh eating ritual. And this is why they do this, is because of the verse in the Bible. And as they were eating it, Jesus took bread and he blessed it. And he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And it is a bit strange that people continue these rituals today without really knowing the origin of just exactly where these things come from. This can cross the line into offensive territory, but this is forewarned in the Bible because the Jews began to argue sharply amongst themselves saying how can this man give us his flesh to eat and Jesus said to them I tell you the truth unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood you have no life in you whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. And upon hearing this, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? The physical body and the blood part, that's the symbolic part. But before we can get into this, we need to understand the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls are a collection of ancient writings containing nearly all of the Old Testament. They were discovered in caves near the Dead Sea in Qumran from 1947 into the mid-1950s. This caused immense anticipation from Christians everywhere as the scrolls were thought to be a guarantee for the church to prove Christianity correct. It appeared as though the only thing left to do was to read and interpret the scrolls and Christians would have all the proof they needed. This was because the Dead Sea Scrolls were written in the Semitic language of Aramaic between 250 BCE and 136 CE. This was the era that the Jesus character was said to be walking the earth. To find scrolls written in his language during the period of time in which he was said to be living was a major finding, and Christians everywhere were excited about this. So, what did the scrolls say? Did they read like newspaper headlines speaking of a Jesus of Nazareth? These were questions that had to be answered. Consequently, the best of the best were called upon by the church for their translation skills. John Marco Allegro was a researcher in philology who had graduated with a first class honors degree in Oriental Studies from the University of Manchester. He had earlier begun training for the Methodist ministry but had left to pursue the degree course when he found that studying biblical languages was making him question the foundations of his Christian belief. While working toward a doctorate at Oxford, he was invited to join the Original Scrolls editing team in 1953. In 1954, he became an assistant lecturer at Manchester and considered an up-and-coming philologist in regards to Middle Eastern and Mediterranean languages, Allegro was the only agnostic on the international team of Dead Sea Scrolls translators. 
Most of the other members of this so-called International Scrolls team were ordained Catholic priests. The work of this team, which was organized by Father DeVoe, was originally supposed to be published as soon as possible and open to scholarly interpretation. John Allegro was the only member to publish all of his translations in the learned journals as soon as he felt they were ready to be laid open to scrutiny. The other members of the team tended to hold on to their allocations for so long that some people, including Allegro from time to time, suspected a cover-up and suppression of the research. In fact, Allegro was asked several times to hold back on some of his translations for several years or face retribution. He sometimes unwillingly complied. If not a cover-up, an unwillingness to tell all, all at once. There always was a feeling that if we go carefully, we can release the information in a way that need generate no hostility or over-questioning. But we will do. We will control it. By 1968, Allegro completed and published all of his translations of the Cave 4 scroll fragments assigned to him. In the 15 years since the international team was put together in 1953, Allegro was the only member to finish his assigned duty. The remaining scrolls were not published until 1991 when the Huntington Library in San Marino, California finally released the photographs of all the scrolls to expedite their publication. The other members of the original team held on to most of their translations until after 1997, which was 29 years or more after Allegro and 50 years or more since the original discovery of the scrolls in 1947. During this time, scholars who attempted to question the orthodox view, as Allegro found out, had their careers destroyed. There is much to learn about John Allegro. He was the only member who wasn't a committed Christian and considered himself agnostic. An agnostic is someone who doesn't believe in nor against any religious philosophy, and this placed Allegro at an unbiased advantage over the rest of the Dead Sea Scrolls team. The other men, unlike Allegro, had a vested interest in maintaining the status quo, that Jesus was a real man and that the scrolls in no way threatened the foundations of Christianity. Because of Allegro's differing ideas on the scrolls and his public statements about them, he was made the target of sharp and unjustified criticism by his teammates who attacked him in the press. And it seemed to me in the reference in that scroll to crucifixion that it brought us much closer to the Christian story the myth of Jesus. And then when I published this, there was such an outburst, uproar, not least among my colleagues, who were afraid of the fear that it would upset people that Jesus was the first prophet to have been crucified or something. Uh, no more than that. The, 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 the links between Jesus and the, the leader of the Essenes were much closer, or could have been much closer than it had been realized that the uniqueness of the Christian story was a, it was a risk, that they then wrote a letter to the Times, and I realized then I'd walked into a minefield. But by 1967, Allegro's openness to other ideas had brought him in contact with the works of Professor Ramsbottom of London's Botanical Museum. Ramsbottom is likely the proper founder of the field of ethnomycology. Allegro also came across the works of R. Gordon Wasson, the famous amateur mycologist who is presently credited as the founder of this field of study. These people had suggested that the foundations of Hinduism and early Judaism were based on drug cults that used the Amanita muscaria mushroom. Allegro, based on his deep understanding of biblical lore, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and ancient history and language concluded that the foundations of Christianity could not be any different. I believe that the innocent collection of tales and sayings, which was apparently allowed to pass freely among the beleaguered cells of believers, in hourly danger of discovery and execution, was but a cover story. From that highly improbable account of a gentle rabbi, 
friend of little children, Roma tax collectors, and ladies with gynecological problems, could be distilled by skilled interpreters, well versed in the art of rabbinic exegesis, as well as the abracadabra of Gnostic mysticism, secret passwords and sayings, the formulae for medicaments and hallucinatory drugs, the therapia in practice and prescription which had earned them their reputation and name of Asaya Essenes, physicians. By 1970, Allegro published what he considered the pinnacle of his research, a book he thought would launch him into history as one of the world's great thinkers, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. In this book, Allegro exposes the foundation of Christianity as not only a derivative of astrotheology, but he also exposes that much of the mythology paralleling Christianity is firmly rooted in fertility cults and psychedelic drug use, especially that of the Amanita Muscaria. Throughout the rest of his life, Allegro published several books, including the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Christian Myth, that furthered his research into this area. However, the publication of The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, instead of launching Allegro as a famous thinker, destroyed his career. No scholar at the time would publicly debate Allegro on a point-by-point -point basis. They instead resorted to unfounded public attacks. However, hindsight is 2020, and we, amongst many other researchers, think that Allegro, at least in large part, was correct. And some great thinkers are not recognized for their contributions until after their lives have ended. Allegro died on his 65th birthday, February 17, 1988. In May of 2005, John Allegro's daughter, Judith Ann Brown, published John Marco Allegro, The Maverick of the Dead Sea Scrolls. This book debunks most of the unfounded attacks against Allegro through the Allegro archives and his many missives. growth cycle of this mushroom is important to understand because our ancient ancestors who made these myths would watch this mushroom and see how it grew and those attributes were applied to a deity. So the growth cycle is very important to understand and just to run through this really quickly the mushroom begins as a spore. These spores are too small to be seen individually by the naked eye we can see clusters of spores, but the spore is like the seed of the mushroom. And the part of the mushroom that we can see is the part of the mushroom used to spread the seed. It is the phallic portion of the mushroom. The actual body of the mushroom is the mycelium that is below the ground and attaching itself to the roots of the tree. So the mushroom attaches itself to the roots of the tree and it cannot live without this tree. These mushrooms live in a symbiotic, microizole symbiotic relationship with the tree. And they help the tree, they feed the tree nutrients, and the tree feeds them nutrients. So they kind of live in harmony together. So these mushrooms are seen as the fruiting body of the tree. Just as nature needs a tree to grow apples, nature also needs a tree to grow these mushrooms. And just as an apple is something that is used by nature to spread a seed, so is the mushroom. So we see three stages of the mushroom's growth cycle here. And the mushroom appears to be going through an egg stage. A lot of mushrooms do this. The amanita is one of them that appears to look like an egg in this stage of growth. And it's white. And on the right here, you see the red cap of the mushroom peering through. And what it is breaking through is called the universal veil. So the universal veil tears to expose the red cap of the mushroom. And it is a universal veil. It covers the entire mushroom. The universal veil covers the entire mushroom. So as the veil tears, as the red mushroom cap gets bigger and bigger, the veil peels itself across the top of the mushroom and it leaves these remnants, these veil remnants that leave white spots on the mushroom. 
So now this is the male portion of the mushroom. These stages of growth of the mushroom are considered male phallic. As you see the mushroom getting stronger and stronger. So the mushroom cap is now completely outside the veil of the mushroom and the veil of the mushroom has now attached itself to the rim of the cap of the mushroom and it is concealing the gills of the mushroom. And as the mushroom cap expands further and further and further, this universal veil cannot stretch any further and it begins to tear and this is seen as the circumcision of the mushroom. As the mushroom expands further, the universal veil separates itself completely from the underside of the cap, falls, and hangs on the stalk or stipe of the mushroom like a skirt. The amanita will continue to grow upward, flattening itself into a small table. One may wish to keep in mind that the Knights of the Round Table were, or are, if these knights ever evolved into the Knights Templars, the keepers and protectors of the Holy Grail. This is important to remember because the next stage in the growth cycle of this mushroom is the cup or grail stage. The mushroom cap continues to turn upward and the cap becomes somewhat of a cup or chalice and will often hold the morning dew or rain. When the morning dew collects in the cup of the upturned mushroom cap, some of the psychedelic substances are drawn out of the mushroom and into the water. Consequently, the water is colored red like blood. Some of this bright red pigment from the mushroom's cap bleeds into the water. This, among other things, will fade the mushroom from a bright red into an orange-like or golden color. Although the psychedelic effects would not be nearly as intense as a belly full of mushrooms, one could literally take this golden colored chalice shaped mushroom and drink the blood of Jesus from the Holy Grail. Not only is this mushroom the literal Holy Grail, it is also the mythological phoenix. The phoenix is born from its ashes, but it will never live to leave its nest, for as it lifts its wings in attempt to fly, it bursts into flames and engulfs itself, leaving nothing behind but its own ashes, and the cycle continues. Here are the eggs in the nest, the colorful red eggs of the phoenix. The amanita resembles a red bird with wings. As the phoenix lifts its wings in attempt to fly, it bursts into flames and engulfs itself. As the fungus quickly decomposes, it leaves nothing behind, but its own ashes, the millions of mushroom spores, and the hair-like mycelia attached to the roots of the tree that grow underground. And as the cycle continues, as the mushroom spores serve as the seed of the mushroom, seemingly planting itself in the same location over and over. And these stories were created to pass this type of knowledge down Easter is a great example of this. The Easter egg hunt is a mushroom hunt. You find the correct mushroom. It's a way of identifying the mushroom. Find us the correct mushroom and we'll get you a treat. And who better to go hunting these mushrooms, these colorful little egg-like mushrooms, or the big holy grail type mushrooms, who better to go find these mushrooms than little kids who can crawl up underneath these trees rather than some big clumsy adult. These mushrooms have a symbiotic relationship with these trees, conifer trees. They love conifer trees, pine trees. They flourish under pine trees. And this mushroom is the hidden mushroom, hidden eggs. You can see here this big bright red mushroom is obvious on the screen, but just below it is one that's hidden. So you have to have a good eye. Depending on the season and depending on the area, these mushrooms can be gold as well. So they are the golden egg. We see these mushrooms reflected in our Easter cards as well. A kind Easter wishes as the gnome is leaning upon the mushroom with his 
sacred text or his recipe book open. So we pass this knowledge down to our children. We initiate the children. So like Santa Claus who dresses in red and white, the shaman will dress in the colors of their sacred plants and the Amanita using shaman will dress in the red and white colors of the Amanita muscaria. And here we see the Pope dressing in something that looks quite a bit like the Amanita mushroom and the snow adds a little extra effect putting the white dots on the red cap. The popes and cardinals all throughout history have dressed just like this Amanita muscaria mushroom. This figure identifies the Virgin Mary in the Dormition icon as Amanita form. Notice the red cap, the skirt-like wrap over the shoulders, and the hash marks at the bottom. As we mentioned earlier, medieval cathedrals that were primarily used for religious study were often called mystery schools. And here you can see a sunburst made out of stained glass above a mushroom shaped doorway all of it based in sacred geometry and the Eleusinian mysteries were undoubtedly the most famous of the secret religious rites of ancient Greece and here is Persephone and Demeter and what are they doing? Well the most important part of the Eleusinian mysteries was the ingestion of the Kikion or the Kaikion and what could that have been? It was an initiation. The road to Eleusis argues strongly that Demeter's potion, the Kikion, was entheogenic, most likely ergot. And more recently, Professor Carl Ruck of Boston University argues in Sacred Mushrooms, Secrets of Eleusis, that the Kikion was a mushroom. We'd like to discuss Santa Claus again for a moment. This mysterious old man somehow got himself intertwined into the Christian celebrations of the birth of their deity. In the Middle Ages, Santa was a shaman, and you can easily trace many similarities between the shamans of the past into our Christmas traditions of today. A shaman is, in many ways, similar to what we more commonly refer to in America as a medicine man. In Siberia, the local shaman was the oracle of the community. Nothing of importance happened in the community without the okay from the shaman. The shaman would also hold very strong plant knowledge. This knowledge included plants for medicine and healing, poisons and warfare, and powerful hallucinogenic plants used in their religious ceremonies. You can often find chimney sweeps on old holiday postcards holding the Amanita muscaria mushroom. This is but a subtle hint to the connection of someone with the Amanita mushroom and a chimney. The ancient shamans of Siberia would go to the houses, huts, or yurts of the people in the community in celebration of the winter solstice and bring them these pre-dried mushrooms and often guide them through the experience. It was their yearly tradition. If the main door to the yurt was snowed over, which they often were during the winter time, it is said that the shaman would enter symbolically through the secondary entrance. This just so happens to be the smoke hole in the roof or the chimney. The shaman, dressing in red and white and carrying a huge bag full of Amanita muscaria mushrooms that he had picked and dried during the previous season, enough for an entire community, would go door to door bartering and selling his dried mushrooms. And how would the shaman travel? He used a sleigh, and the animals pulling the sleigh were not dogs or horses. The Siberian shaman used caribou, also known as reindeer as they were indigenous to Siberia. 
Amanita muscaria mushrooms go through a chemical process called decarboxylation as they dry. We'll talk more about this chemical process in a minute, but they also go through a physical process when they dry. They get lighter. They retain much of their potency when they are dried, and in fact, chemically speaking, they get stronger. And this allows the shaman to consume more than if the mushrooms were wet and heavy. Even to this day, it is a common practice for people to stack their mushrooms in socks and hang them over the fireplace overnight to dry them out. But imagine that you're in a pine forest hunting mushrooms for your entire community. These mushrooms can grow to be quite large, and the sack that you use to carry the mushrooms in would get quite heavy. But knowing that these mushrooms should be dried before ceremonial ingestion, it would be wise to dry them out before carrying them home. This would allow you to carry more, and it would keep the mushrooms on the bottom of the sack from being crushed by the weight of the others. One good way to dry the mushrooms, as you continue to hunt for more, is to select a tree in a central location and use its bows as a basket to hold your freshly picked mushrooms, drying them in the sun as you search for more. This would look a lot like a decorated Christmas tree. And as we mentioned, the red and white mushroom Christmas ornaments are some of the oldest ornaments you can find. The oldest of all Christmas tree decorations were edible. When the church adopted the Christmas tree, making it okay for Christians to have one and often placing one in the church as well, the ornaments on the tree were the Eucharist, the body of Christ. And the mushrooms are, as John Allegro pointed out, literally the flesh of God. And symbolically placing the Eucharist on the Christmas tree is a direct representation of placing the mushrooms on the Christmas tree. So I'd like to change gears for just a moment and discuss the Fountains of Living Waters, also known as the Fountain of Youth. This ties back to the death and the rebirth experience where the shaman will train for death with the same determination as a boxer would train for a fight. After all, one cannot conquer death without training for such an event. We mentioned that the mushroom should be dried before consumption, but drying the mushroom is only half of this ceremonial process. Drying the mushroom will indeed allow one to consume more of the active ingredients but in order to evoke the shamanic death and rebirth experience, the shamans will often consume their urine after ingesting the mushroom. This is done because the urine is now infused with the psychedelic ibutenic acid in musimol, and anyone who consumes this laced urine will have the psychedelic experience. The very thought of drinking your own urine is indeed a turnoff, especially in our society today. But for the shaman growing up around these things, this was a common practice. And urine can actually be good for you. I'm not going to go into the details here, but the results for an internet search for urine therapy might surprise you. Here is the homunculus again, or the little man, urinating into the water fountain. And fountains do not use fresh water, and consequently, he is recycling his water, and this is a huge key for those who are seeking the Holy Grail. This is a depiction of one of the greatest mystical symbols in alchemy, the Ouroboros. It is a symbol for eternal life. The Ouroboros is symbolized by a snake biting its own tail and often it is represented as a winged dragon above a serpent, both biting one another's tail, staying true to the mystical theme with the wings above and the serpent below. 
And the symbol for the Ouroboros can also be found in Christianity. And what's interesting in this image is not that the all-seeing eye is representing God or that the Holy Spirit is the bird, but Jesus is represented by a snake, the Ouroboros. And more on that in just a moment. The Bible quotes Jesus as saying, If any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And the Bible tells us that we are supposed to drink water from our own cistern, running water from our own well. And this is all a part of the recipe, all a part of understanding these ancient shamanic techniques when they consumed this Amanita mushroom in their rituals. And this leads us directly into the twin fountains and two waters. In the book of John, the story of the woman at the well, the woman says to Jesus, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? And Jesus said to her, Whoever drinks this water will be thirsty again. Whoever drinks the water that I give him will never be thirsty. The water that I give him will become in him a well of life that lasts forever. Two different kinds of water. Here's the alchemical depiction of Mount Helicon and the twin fountains atop a mushroom-shaped hill. This displays the tree of life next to the phallic-shaped fountain with twin spouts. And on either side of the phallic obelisk at the Vatican, are twin fountains. Both of these fountains resemble the Amanita mushroom in both the canopy stage and the Holy Grail stage of growth. Hidden in plain sight in the Vatican courtyard, the Holy Grail has become all but invisible. The twin fountains throughout alchemy and mysticism represent two different types of water. More precisely, they represent two different types of urine. And this gives a whole new meaning to the terms water into wine and take and drink. Clark Heinrich points out this image of Titan's Bacchanal of the Andreans. Here is the homunculus again, urinating now into a river of wine. And this man is scooping it up into a pitcher and passing it around as everyone is drinking it. And there is a line from a French songbook in the foreground that reads, He who drinks and does not drink again does not know what drinking is. This symbol is called the caduceus, and it is the serpent entwined staff that is used as a symbol for healing and for drugs today. After the exodus from Egypt, Moses placed a serpent on a staff and used it to heal his people. The serpent entwined staffs are the symbol of Asclepius, the Greek god of medicine and his association with medicine is his association with the serpent. Here is the serpent entwined staff with the wings at the top in a caduceus-like totem in Tiananmen Square. The person holding the mace in the U.S. Capitol has absolute authority to speak, as the mace is a scepter of authority. Notice its design. Symbolically speaking, the Egyptian winged sun disk is a stylized variation of the caduceus. The wings are there, the serpents are there, and the disk represents the crown of the staff of the caduceus. And what do we do to our Christmas tree? We place red and white gifts below it, representing the entheogens, 
we entwine it with ribbon representing the kundalini energy rising up the body and we place wings at the top completing the symbol of the caduceus the very tree under which these mushrooms grow in nature becomes the symbol for the drugs themselves, the caduceus. And now we can return to the deity portrayed in this stance and get an entirely new perspective. It should be totally clear why this posture or this stance is so important. We see Krishna doing it, the goddess doing it, the caduceus, all standing with this posture, all standing like the Amanita mushroom as this deity is wearing only a draping around his waist and thorns on his head. Getting high, or the most high as we call God, is about climbing the cosmic ladder to Godhead, and ladders predominate in alchemy and mysticism. Jacob rests his head on some sort of a stone and has dreams of a ladder to heaven. In Christianity, in Freemasonry, even the tale of Jack and the Beanstalk, Jack climbs a vine to the heavens or this cosmic spiral ladder to Godhead, and what does he find there? The golden eggs. The golden eggs of alchemy. The Amanita muscaria mushroom. Real gold is only a materialistic item that will get you nowhere in the afterlife. But this shamanic out-of-body experience is preparation for actual death. It's training for that crossover period from this reality into whatever is our next reality. And here is Mithra standing on top of this cosmic egg or the primordial mound. And he has an entwined serpent around his body making the caduceus and symbolizing drugs. Mithra is the drug itself, the mushroom. The Amanita muscaria mushroom is also born from a primordial mound. Mithra has tail feathers like those that the mushroom does, the annulus, and he also has wings atop his shoulders representing the upturned gills of the mushroom. Continuing with the symbolism of the mushroom, we find the divine hermaphrodite, polar opposites combined into one entity, usually male and female, with wings upon its back and it's this personified dualistic deity that leads us into the rebus or the re-re two things oftentimes the rebus will be seen with a cup in one hand and a serpent or an ouroboros in the other it is standing upon mercury and venus with serpents in the cup representing the poison or the drugs contained in the cup the medicine the Amanita muscaria mushroom is seen as both male and female sex organs of its personified deity. Here you can see the stalk of the mushroom penetrating the cap in the act of divine coitus. The male and female portions of the mushroom consist of a breast and a yoni for the female and a single testicle and penis for the male. By splitting the mushroom open in its earlier growth stages, the act of sex is blatant. All that is missing are the bodies of the god and goddess. In the Hindu myth, Shiva is a hermaphrodite. Like the mushroom, Shiva has a penis, one testicle, and a breast. In the book of Genesis, Eve was created from the rib of Adam. Actually, at this point, Adam is a hermaphrodite. Male and female, he created them and blessed them, and he called their name Adam in the day when they were created.
Adam, being male, represents the mushroom in its earlier phallic-like growth stages. While Eve, the female, is the womb-like opening of the gills. The reverse side, the single breast of the cap, is literally the Eve of the mushroom. When the Amanita's cap separates to form the Eve or canopy, it figuratively pulls a rib out of the stalk or stipe of the mushroom. The mushroom's universal veil tears away from the ribs and drops down forming a skirt or apron. The Eve of the mushroom appears to be born from the rib or from the side of the male portion of the mushroom. Because this is the portion of the mushroom that is most often consumed, this is also the portion of the mushroom that provides enlightenment. The female provides enlightenment and the female comes from the rib of the male. But there is another story in the Bible of enlightenment coming from the side of man. Not only is Eve born of the rib of Adam, but Jesus hanging on the cross is lanced in the rib and out of his side comes the blood that is collected into the Holy Grail. So out of the rib comes the enlightenment once again. The Canterbury Psalter from 1147 has 12 segments representing the 12 signs of the zodiac. Each segment is a representation from the different parts of the creation of the world epic described in the book of Genesis. In the top right segment we see Jesus or God as the Lord of magical plants. The red mushroom on the right is clearly the Amanita muscaria. The Amanita is said to produce the quickening of the spirit. The next one is obviously another mushroom, but it is blue. This indicates psilocybe mushrooms, which are said to open the third eye. Next may be a depiction of a Syrian rue pod, shaped as a mushroom, which happens to match this in color as well as a similar structure. Syrian rue, or Paganum harmala, is known to increase the effects of other compounds and also possesses other qualities. On the left is a depiction of an opium poppy, also shaped as a mushroom, and due to the euphoria it induces, it helps one to relax enough to let go in order to fully experience the visionary state. It helps one withstand the intense experience without the constant urge to make it stop, which is not an option, by the way. Another panel depicts the scene in the Garden of Eden with the serpent. Notice that the serpent has the entwined staff, which is actually the stem of a mushroom. It looks a bit like the Amanita muscaria, although it does appear to depict some type of psilocybe mushroom or other types of mushrooms as well. At the very top of the center tree or serpent entwined mushroom may be seen little mushrooms inside the cap. This is an alchemical depiction by Nicholas Flamel of a woman clothed in the sun. She has a crown of stars on her head and she is pregnant. She has the wings of eagles on her back and she is standing on a crescent moon. To her right is a leviathan-like serpent with seven heads and it is sweeping the stars out of the sky with its tail. On the left is an image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. She is the Mexican equivalent of the Catholic Virgin. Notice that she too is clothed with the sun. The crescent moon is below her. Below that is a leviathan-like serpent with the seven heads. The stars that the leviathan was sweeping out of the sky in the alchemical image are now hidden in the clothing of the goddess. And we have shown where some of the symbolism comes from in the heavens. But let's take a deeper look into this icon, Our Lady of Guadalupe. The story of the woman and the dragon is found in the book of Revelation, Revelation 12, where it reads, A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with a moon under her feet and a crown of stars on her head. She was pregnant and she cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. And then another sign appeared in heaven, 
an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all nations with an iron scepter. So this is the Cosmic Christ, the first man, Adam Cadman. Who else would get snatched up to God and to his throne but the Son of God? After all, if God gave his only begotten Son, he must have had an only begotten Son to give. And this is the birth of this mythological deity. In the Nag Hammadi text, which is older than the Bible, and the origin of many of the stories in the Bible itself, you can find a very interesting story on the origin of the world. Sophia sent her daughter Zoe, being called Eve, as an instructor in order that she might make Adam. When Eve saw her male counterpart cast down, she had pity upon him and said, Adam, become alive, arise upon the earth. And then what happened? Well, immediately her word became accomplished fact, for Adam, having arisen, suddenly opened his eyes. When he saw her, he said, You shall be called the mother of the living, for it is you who have given me life. And then the authorities were informed that their mottled form was alive and had arisen, and they were greatly troubled. They sent seven archangels to see what had happened. They came to Adam. When they saw Eve talking to him, they said to one another, What sort of thing is this luminous woman? For she resembles that likeness which appeared to us in the light. So what did they do to her? Now come, let us lay hold of her and cast our seed into her, so that when she becomes soiled, she may not be able to ascend into her light. Rather, those that she bears will be under our charge. But let us not tell Adam, for he is not one of us. Rather, let us bring a deep sleep over him and instruct him in his sleep to the effect that she came from his rib in order that his wife may obey and that he may be lord over her. So the gods, or these seven authorities, these landlords, are forcing a patriarchal setting I call them landlords, but they are also the seven of them. In the older texts, these seven authorities tell Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree of knowledge. In the newer version, the Bible, these seven landlords simply become the Lord in all capital letters, but they are by no means the great architect of the universe. They represent a governing body, and in this story they represent the governing body of the Garden of Eden. So this fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, did it contain poison? Is that what God was warning them about? Eat this and you will die resembles something that is poisonous, but the serpent assured Eve that she would not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden. God punished them for knowing good from evil. But they did not die in the day that they ate this forbidden fruit. As a matter of fact, both of them lived to be hundreds of years old. So according to the Bible, what the serpent told Eve was the truth, and God was lying.
Why does God lie to them? Having the knowledge of good and evil seems like a strange thing to condemn someone for. People are often incarcerated today because of crimes they committed resulting from their lack of knowledge of good and evil. Unless these gods wanted to tell us what was right and wrong rather than to have us know the difference. To the Gnostics, Jesus was the wise serpent who gave knowledge unto man. This Lucifer-like serpent was the good one who gave us the knowledge that separates us from other animals. Jesus and Lucifer are likened to the two serpents on the staff of the Caduceus. They are bound together so tightly they are inseparable. These two forces are the macrocosm and the microcosm forces in this mythology. One of them, Lucifer, has been cast down out of the heavens onto the earth. And the other, Jesus, is the risen Savior. Making the forbidden fruit an apple is obviously symbolic. An apple was chosen because it is a perfect fit for the actual forbidden fruit. Apples are red and they are the fruiting body of a tree. The Amanita muscaria is also red and it too is the fruiting body of a tree. When you take a bite out of an apple, you see the same white inside that you would see if you find an Amanita muscaria mushroom in the wild with a bite taken out of it by a deer or another animal. It is a safe alchemical representation of the actual fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil without giving away any actual knowledge of the fruit itself. We know that apple trees are not found among trees of the forest. However, this verse is symbolically telling us where the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil may be found. Looking in a pine forest for apples would be a good start. Christians will agree that Christ is the anointed one, as Christos means anointed one. But anointed with what? The chrism as in the anointing oil, or Crisco. Crisco is the Chris company, or the oil company, and there are associations to fertility worship that will be left for another time. But when you think of Jesus Christ as the oil itself, or as the medicine, or entheogens themselves, the miracles do make much more sense. Oil walking on water, and Healing the sick with its touch is really only the beginning. But if Jesus was the great teacher, then why is it that we have no need for anyone to teach us when all we need is the anointing to teach us of all things? It seems as though this anointing is more important than the teacher. This holy oil was also used by monks who would shave rings around their heads and marinate a skull cap in entheogenically infused oil. And this cap was placed on the fresh razor burn on their heads and the ring of hair around their head would serve as a sponge preventing the oil from running down their eyes and into their face and down the back of their neck. And witches practice similar ceremonies. The woman would put green plant material all over her skin, consequently turning her skin green. And she would also put these oils in the most capillary rich areas that she could find on her body, which just so happened to be between her legs. And the green witch with the broom handle between her legs has become the icon for the Halloween holiday. So we would like to talk about the mark of the beast for just a moment. Today this mark has been reduced to a number 666 or 660 and 6. And this is how this was written in ancient Greek, the language the New Testament was originally written in. But before we get into this mark of the beast, we would like to sidetrack for just a moment and talk about two other symbols. The Cairo is known as the monogram for Jesus Christ, and it's made up of an X and a P.
The Greek name Rho Chi is the universal symbol for pharmacy or drugs. It is the recipe for the pharmacy and the drugs. And again, Greek was the original language of the New Testament. And in Greek, the P and the R are interchangeable. So if we take this X in the monogram of Christ and move it from an overlaid position to an inline position, the RX is revealed. Is it a P or is it an R? It's an interchangeable symbol for the drugs and for the deity. The caduceus is directly related to Mercury. The word merchant derives from the root of the word mercury. Mercury is the bearer of the caduceus and was the one who gave permission to be a merchant or to buy, sell, and trade. To be a merchant, you had to have the symbol of mercury, the caduceus. To be a merchant, one also had to have the knowledge of the merchandise. This merchandise was commonly herbs, spices, and drugs. The coins used during this period were used to purchase these goods. On the front of this coin is Caesar Nero. On the back of this coin is the caduceus and the cornucopia. The caduceus was the mark that controlled the sale of the drugs back then, and it still is. Today no one can legally buy or sell medicine without this mark. Today. The dollar sign is likely a representation of the caduceus. We can still not buy or sell anything without this mark. And, as a reversal of the single and dual snakes climbing the staff of Asclepius and the caduceus, the dollar sign is represented with a single serpent and both single and dual vertical lines. This is the Bank of England. Inside the dividend office, notice the caduceus on the walls. The quest for the true manna will guide you directly to entheogens. This is a psilocybe mushroom. These mushrooms are more common than the amanita and are often categorically labeled as shrooms. Their active ingredient is psilocybin. The Los Angeles Biomedical Research Institute at Harbor UCLA Medical Center is conducting a study designed to measure the effectiveness of the novel psychoactive medication psilocybin on reduction of anxiety, depression, and physical pain. All participants in this study have stage 4 cancer and anxiety. They are between the ages of 18 and 65 and do not have a history of major psychiatric disorders. Participants spend two nights at the hospital, undergo an MRI scan of the brain, and receive psilocybin. This is a double-blind study, meaning that the participants are given a placebo and the active medication, but they are not told which drug is administered when. Participants are encouraged to bring along personal photos and some of their favorite music. If this experience could be put into words, these cancer patients could either simply be told this mystery or undergo counseling. Only through the ingestion of a true sacrament, entheogens, can these terminally ill cancer patients have such a profound experience that they no longer fear death. This is a personal paradigm shift for each participant. Another recent study, performed by John Hopkins University and published in May of 2006, concluded that psilocybin appeared to create the same experience as the ancient and mystical experiences found in our religions. Harvard's Good Friday experiment came to the same conclusion decades ago. Inside psilocybin mushrooms is O-phosphoryl 4-hydroxy inin dimethyltryptamine. Dimethyltryptamine is DMT. Keep this in mind because these three letters will come up often throughout the rest of this lecture. There were two types of manna in the Bible. 
manna from heaven, which appeared many times during the voyage out of Egypt, and the hidden manna, which is only mentioned once in Revelation. As the story goes, before his celebrity status, Moses was a shepherd. He lived off the land, eating herbs and building campfires. His life in many ways must have resembled the Native American or the shaman that we have come to know. On at least two occasions, Moses wandered over to Mount Sinai. It was on this mountain, which was also called Horeb, or Median over time, that Moses encountered a bush that spoke to him. A bush that was on fire, but did not burn. A burning bush that did not consume. This bush spoke to him with a voice that could be none other than the voice of God. This truly sounds like a hallucination. Inanimate objects speaking, visions of flames, communication with the gods, etc. The word manna literally translates to, what is this? This manna was said to have appeared on the ground overnight, and it came with the dew in the morning. Psilocybe mushrooms appear overnight and flourish when there is dew on the ground. And if it was your first time to eat these mushrooms, your reaction just might be, what is this? A variety of psilocybe containing mushrooms also grow atop the dung of cattle. The abundance of manure from their cattle would have provided ideal conditions for these mushrooms to grow. After fleeing Egypt, Moses did not wander the wilderness for as long as some would think. Moses knew where he was going and he took his people directly back to Mount Sinai where he first encountered the burning bush. This is when he went back up the mountain and a few days later he came down with the first set of Ten Commandments. Since Moses had to travel to a certain location to speak to this bush, it can be suggested that Moses encountered the hidden manna on that mountain. He found a mushroom that only grows under trees. One that looks like it is burning, but it is not. Knowing that he would find this hidden manna on this particular mountain, Moses went back there as soon as he could. Here is a photograph of a psilocybe mushroom. Notice that the stipe of this mushroom is turning blue. When you grab a hold of these mushrooms and bruise them, they bruise blue, similar to a magnolia tree's white flower bruising brown. Jesus is often represented wearing blue, but even more significant symbolism of this mushroom can be found in India. Because when you understand that these sacred plants help sculpt all of the major religions, it will help make sense to learn that in Indian mythology, Lord Vishnu is blue and his incarnation is Krishna, just like the body of the psilocybe mushroom is blue. Shiva has an extensive following. According to Hindu mythology, when the demons and deities churned the milky ocean, 14 jewels surfaced, one of which was poison. Poisonous fumes threatened to overwhelm the entire world, so Shiva drank the poison. The poison was so intense that Shiva's throat turned blue, which is why Shiva earned the nickname Nilakantha, the blue-throated. Also note the third eye in this image of Shiva. Here is Rama. Notice that there is no eye contact going on here. Rama's headdress seems to be the center of attention. Krishna is also blue and he is typically depicted with a cow or cattle. Psilocybe cubensis mushrooms grow on cow dung. As a result, holy cows produce holy crap, whereupon the holy sacrament grows in nature. Do these mushrooms stimulate the kundalini? This kundalini energy will rise through the body. It will enlighten each of the chakras, including the third eye chakra and the crown chakra. Notice once again, the symbol of the caduceus inside our bodies. Kundalini literally translates into snake or serpent power. These serpents are climbing our spinal staff, making the symbolic caduceus. 
The third eye chakra is often symbolized by placing a dot on the forehead. Illuminating the third eye chakra will in turn burst open the crown chakra. The Native American Indian chief wears a feather headdress to symbolize this. The headdress is a representation of his crown chakra being wide open. This is symbolized often in different traditions. Here in Christianity we see this crown chakra open symbolized by placing a shell behind his head. In the story of the Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes down onto man and rests over the heads of the people in the temple. The Holy Spirit, represented as a flame, is symbolic of crown chakra illumination. DMT is the most psychedelic substance known to man and it is produced naturally in our bodies. Dr. Rick Strassman, author of DMT The Spirit Molecule, was, at the time his research began, the first doctor allowed to perform psychedelic or entheogenic studies in the U.S. for over 20 years. With intravenous DMT injection, Strassman was able to recreate, unintentionally of course, the alien abduction experience, as well as many levels of out-of-body and religious experiences in the clinical setting. These same chemical compounds can be found in the excretions of a Bufo alivarius toad. These excretions were dried and then smoked and the effects were extremely psychedelic. And then there is ayahuasca. This is a brew made from a combination of two plants found in the Amazon. One contains DMT but when it is consumed our bodies break it down before this chemical makes it into our bloodstream. The shaman then found an MAO inhibitor, allowing the DMT to pass into the bloodstream without being destroyed in the gut. And if you ask the Amazonian shaman how they learned to combine these plants to achieve this, they would likely answer that the plants taught them. More than likely it was discovered in a salad-like mixture. Four LSD-like compounds exist naturally in the human brain. This is from the Boston Globe. In our bodies we have wings above our spinal staff. This darkened area looking like wings is the ventricle system of the brain. The ventricle system in the brain is a series of cavities and chambers that allow cerebral spinal fluid to flow around the brain. Cerebral spinal fluid is the fluid that the brain floats in to protect itself from injury and cerebral spinal fluid does indeed contain DMT. In Egyptian mythology the eye of Horus was pulled or plucked from the head of Horus by his brother Set. Now we can begin to understand from where this symbol of the Eye of Horus came. It is literally the third eye system inside the human brain. The one eye of Horus represents internal vision. And this internal vision or this internal third eye is opened by these mystifying substances found within the mushrooms and within these naturally occurring chemicals within our brains. This visual symbolic representation has an actual purpose and that's why it is portrayed in such a particular way. A symbol can be true on many scales and each has its different levels of meanings to the different groups who employ them. You could consider a simple triangle and the many degrees of understanding that this particular simple symbol can hold. With keys like this, you can unlock the most elaborate alchemical artwork and decipher its meaning. And through this natural progression, it would make sense to create a character or a deity full of characteristics that represent greater things than the symbol itself.
This nonverbal knowledge has been passed down via symbolism, artwork, deities. It's been written in the stars and hidden in plain sight. And all of it is there just waiting for us to come along and claim ownership to our inheritance. If then we project the Essenism of Qumran forward in time and place, from the Dead Sea Scrolls to the New Testament, we can see a clear line of theological speculation which transformed an exclusive Jewish sectarianism into a Hellenistic mystery religion which could attract the allegiance of all men, Jew or Gentile, bond or free. But the kind of Christianity we arrive at is that not of a faith committed to the historicity of Jesus and the gospel tradition and the imposition of a single canon and a tyrannical creed, but to that Gnostic heresy whose essential individualism was so abhorred by the so-called Great Church and which became the target of a persecution no less ruthless than that of the movement's first political and religious enemies. And to judge from the Church's subsequent history, as well as the illegitimacy of its claims to primacy. One can't help feeling that the wrong side won. Your 
ego image can only be done. I wake from my dream in this dream world alone. I see beyond my dream. does not know that already he is in the land of the immortal. How useless the wisdom of man. things with things. You are free in mind and body.